All right, another day, another response to Trent Horn. Welcome everyone to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today we're going to be looking at this particular video that Trent Horn just released. Alex O'Connor deconstructs Ben Shapiro and Ed Fazer rebutted. I watched the first three to five minutes of this video here, and I thought that there was enough that you guys could benefit from my responses. So that is what we are doing today. This video is going to be on 1.25 times speed that I'm responding to here. And also, I'm probably going to have to be a little bit tamer than normal. And the reason is because I had a migraine yesterday, so I really don't want to trigger anything like that today. Okay, but anyway, let's get into the video. Hey everyone, in this episode, I'm going to look at a portion of Alex O'Connor's reply to Ben Shapiro's case against atheism. So I'm not going to go through the whole video because there's only one part of Alex's reply I was really interested in. So in one part, Ben Shapiro shares the Catholic philosopher Ed Fazer's argument from motion for the existence of God which is based on Aquinas's first way. Now, I've shared the argument for motion in a previous debate with Alex, though Alex didn't give a reply to the argument in the debate. Now, that has been a consistent theme, that a lot of Trent's interlocutors have been unable to properly respond to his arguments, and that's why I've put together so many different responses to Trent. You can see in particular these three. One of them was I responded to his case against uh, Alex O'Connor in his debate there. Trent responded in turn to what I said, and then I made this four-hour response to him. And then I also responded to his case at the Capturing Christianity Conference. So check out those three. It's in my response videos playlist, but also you can just find them on my channel. So I was really excited to see what he would say about it in this video. So first I'm going to play Ben Shapiro summarizing the argument, then I'll go into Alex's objections. Though I do commend Alex because he does a good job in his reply explaining the argument for motion in detail because Shapiro is actually pretty brief about it. So here's how Ben Shapiro describes the argument. Turns out there are a bevy of logically consistent arguments offered on behalf of God. <laughs> Logically consistent. Oh, nice. Oh, it's so painful. Just very painful when I see Ben Shapiro dip his toes into philosophy. Take, for example, the first cause proof advanced by Aristotle as refined by Thomas Aquinas. Edward Fazer lays out the argument in his book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. And this is where, of course, the self-plugs are going to come. This is going to be very brief, though. For starters, I published a paper in Sophia on stage one of the Aristotelian Proof of Critical Appraisal, so check that out if you're interested. It contains a number of my published criticisms of the Aristotelian Proof. Fazer read this paper and responded on his blog, and I responded in turn. His response contains some egregious misrepresentations and so on, but anyway, check out this blog response. I also talk about stage two of the Aristotelian Proof. And then in another published piece, Existential Inertia in the Aristotelian Proof, I criticize the Aristotelian Proof on another front. Fazer in turn responded to this, and I in turn responded to Fazer. I also have an argument from Change Playlist right here, wherein I systematically address this kind of argument from basically every single angle and also my Existential Inertia playlist. And then finally, keep your eyes out for this forthcoming book, Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs, wherein I go through all five of Ed Vaser's proofs in the book that was just shown. You can read the little description here if you're interested. But yeah, it's forthcoming with Springer. As you can see, it's somewhat of a thick book. It's maybe four C's thick. I will let you guys know when this is available to be purchased. More info on that later. But anyway, there are maybe three or four chapters in this book expressly dedicated to the Aristotelian proof. And because I'm feeling particularly munificent, that's a GRE word, uh, I will put two of those chapters in the description. And by the way, I'll link all the stuff that I just mentioned in the description. The argument goes something like this. First, change exists in the world. But all change is the actualization of a potential for that change. So if something is changing, it's because there was a potential for that change in the thing. No potential can be actualized unless something already actual actualizes it. So that means that all change is caused by something already actual. This means either there is an infinite regress of actualizers or there is a purely actual actualizer. This is sort of like the old joke about the philosopher and the turtle. The philosopher is asked, what supports the earth? And he says, a turtle. And somebody says, well, what supports the turtle? And he says, another turtle. So what about that one? He says, it's turtles all the way down. The infinite regress argument is just not convincing. There has to be something underlying the final turtle. The infinite regress argument is just not convincing. Dude, you're the one offering a positive argument. You're the one who needs to convince us that this cannot be the case. It doesn't matter if the person who's raising an objection, hey, maybe there's an infinitely descending regress of causes. It doesn't matter if they don't offer convincing arguments for their case. Anyway. The infinite regress argument is just not convincing. There has to be something underlying the final turtle. There has to be one prime cause. That cause can't have any potential. Because if it had potential, something else could activate it into changing. So there's one unchanging cause that is purely actual. Let me just go back and I'll just, you know, address this one for one just very briefly so you can get a glimpse into some of my criticisms. Of the existence of God. The argument goes something like this. First, change exists in the world. But all change is the actualization of a potential for that change. So if something is changing, it's because there was a potential for that change in the thing. There are a number of things to say here in response. 
Firstly, it's just asserted that change is the actualization of potential in this particular video. And that, set that aside. Secondly, I reject that change is the actualization of potential. If I have an eternalist hat on, change is the variance of properties over the temporal dimension. So it's something having a property at one time and not having a property at another time. By contrast, if I have a presentist hat on, I'd say that change is just the gaining or losing of a property. That doesn't entail that there's some potential for that change. Of course, in ordinary language, by potential, we usually just mean something like a live possibility that something happens. But in the context of the Aristotelian proof, they're using potential in an Aristotelian Thomistic metaphysical sense as a distinctive way or mode of being, as Phaser explicitly says in his book. And it's a kind of middle ground between full-blown actual being and sheer nothingness. I reject that there is any such spooky or ghostly way of being. And I reject that there is some ghostly or ethereal mode of being or way of existence that's in between quote-unquote full-blown actual existence and quote-unquote sheer nothingness. Of course, I think things have various capacities, and I think things can possibly be different in various ways, but that doesn't commit me to a distinctive way or mode of being corresponding to potentials. Moreover, this commitment to an act potency analysis of change faces a difficulty because it explicitly commits to ontological pluralism. As I was just saying, the, the view that there are multiple modes or ways of being or existence, but there are several serious challenges to ontological pluralism and most the vast majority of contemporary metaphysicians reject it. You can see, for instance, my video Existence and Ontological Pluralism with Trenton Merricks for a particularly forceful case against it. You can also see my blog post So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia, section 7.13 for uh, a kind of spelling out of uh, Merrick's argument and relating it to other research, as well as applying it specifically to act potency pluralism. The next thing that I'll note is that I argue in my forthcoming manuscript that this view, this analysis of change in particular, requires something like a dynamic theory of time. Because if you have an eternalist or four dimensionalist or tenseless view of time, for instance, then no, uh, change is not the actualization of potential because you don't have things being in a state of potential being and then becoming actual or transitioning from a state of potential being to a state of actual being. No, every all times are equally actual and so all havings of properties are equally actual. This, the little seed form of the tree or whatever and then the grown tree, they're both equally actual under eternalist views. That doesn't mean you can't have change, it's just you can't analyze change in terms of the actualization of some potential. Because again, both the terminus and the start of the change are equally actual. It's not as though one of them uh, is potential and then transitions from that state of potential to an incompatible state of actuality. And so anyone who's mounting this analysis of change would have to would have to defend the negation of eternalism. And that's going to be an exceedingly heavy task, right? The, so the burden is on them to show that that's a false view. Of course, you know, Phaser has written on this sort of thing, and we actually address some of what Phaser says in our forthcoming manuscript. But anyway, my point is just that uh, people in popular presentations of this argument almost always fail to do their due diligence in properly arguing for the, the relevant premises. Usually it's just flatly asserted. No potential can be actualized unless something already actual actualizes it. So that means that all change is caused by something already actual. This means either there is an infinite regress of actualizers or there is a purely actual actualizer. Okay, so that is quite an obviously false dichotomy. Just because all change is caused by something already actual, right? Sure, that gets us off on some kind of regress, right? So the thing that causes that change is either undergoing change in the relevant respect or it's not. And so if you had an infinite chain here, then you'd have all the things in the chain undergoing change in the relevant respect. So if you deny an infinite regress of these sorts, then that only allows you to conclude that there is something which is not changing in that relevant respect. Nothing follows about whether it can change in other respects. Nothing follows about whether it does change in other respects. Nothing follows about whether this thing's existence is purely actual. In short, it may have potentials that are entirely unrelated to its standing as the terminus of the relevant chain of changes. So it's just a blatant non sequitur to infer that it's purely actual. It could very well be a mixture of act and potency. No potential can be actualized unless something already actual actualizes it. In our book, we actually argue that this principle entails existential inertia. Basically, uh, if no potential becomes actual unless something already actual actualizes it, well, then that means that my potential for ceasing to exist or anything's potential for ceasing to exist at the next moment is not going to become actual, right? It's not, it's not going to actually cease to exist at the next moment unless something already actual comes along to cause it to cease to exist. In other words, something is only going to fail to persist if there's some destructive factor operating on it, in which case, if there's no such destructive factor operating on it, then it's going to persist. And that's basically precisely what existential inertia urges. Anyway, that's just a brief glimpse into the book. So that means that all change is caused by something already actual. This means either there is an infinite regress of actualizers or there is a purely actual actualizer. This is sort of like the old joke about the philosopher and the turtle. The philosopher is asked, what supports the earth? And he says, a turtle. And somebody says, well, what supports the turtle? And he says, another turtle. So what about that one? He says, it's turtles all the way down.
The infinite regress argument is just not convincing. There has to be something underlying the final turtle. There has to be one prime cause. That cause. Of course, just one, right? Just one prime cause, even though he's given literally no reason to think that. Cause can't have any potential. Because if it had potential, something else could activate it into changing. No, if it had potential, it might be able to activate itself into changing. We all actualize our own potentials all the time. I actualize my own potential to form intentions and so on. So no, it doesn't follow that something else could activate it into changing. And even if something else could activate it into changing, that doesn't detract from its status as the first member of the relevant chain of changes. Because it could be changing in respects irrelevant to its status as the first member of the series for which it does serve as terminus. I've gone over this stuff uh, a lot on my channel, so I'm not really going to belabor the point here. If you want to look into that further, just check out all the resources. So there's one unchanging cause that is purely actual. That is the thing that we call God, and it actually- And of course you call it God instead of some impersonal first principle. Actualizes all of the other changes. The most important terms in the argument that you need to understand are actuality and potentiality. The argument from motion says that change is just the reduction of potential to actual. If my coffee is actually cold, it's also potentially hot. Something must actualize the potential for it to be hot like a microwave. It can't become hot on its own. But then something must actualize the microwave's potential to work like an electric current. And you can see where this is going. Ultimately, there must be a purely actual actualizer that explains all the change in the universe. So you can focus on each individual chain of changes, and you might be able to show that each individual chain of changes has a first cause. It doesn't follow that there's some first cause for all the relevant changes that are going on in the universe. That's quite clearly a quantifier shift fallacy. But Alex offers three objections to this particular argument. So let's take a look at them. Now I want to tell you some issues that I have with it. The first problem that I have with this is treating potential as if it's a real quality of an object. To avoid thinking of change as something coming from nothing, we imagine that this hot coffee really has this thing, this potential to become cold. Potential is thought of as a real property of my coffee. So something is changing, it's because there was a potential for that change in the thing. But consider this, my coffee has the potential to be lots of things. In fact, it seems to have the potential to be an infinite number of things. For example, my coffee is currently around 70 degrees Celsius, and it has the potential to cool down to 60 degrees Celsius. It also has the potential to be exactly 60.1 degrees. It has the potential to be 60.11 degrees. It has the potential to be 60.111 degrees, and so on, ad infinitum. Now, a great deal of religious philosophers and non-religious philosophers believe that actual infinites can't exist. For example, this is the basis of William Lane Craig's version of the Kalam cosmological argument. If an infinite number of things really exists, it leads to all kinds of paradoxes. Perhaps most famously, the paradox of Hilbert's hotel. Paradox in very, 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 very large air quotes. The way in which Ghazali shows the impossibility Ghazali. of an actually infinite number of things is by imagining what it would be like if such a collection could exist and then drawing out the absurd consequences from it. More information is in the description. I'll and of course, if you're curious, right, just check out my recent video on Hilbert's Hotel, a comprehensive response. Link my podcast episode with William Lane Craig, one of my favorites to date, in which we talk about this in some detail. Now, it's important to distinguish between actual infinites and potential infinites. Actual infinites would be some kind of actually infinite number of things that exists all at once, whereas potential infinites are things which tend towards infinity without ever actually getting there. For example, I can half the space between my hands, and I can half it again, and I can half it again, and I can half it again, and I can keep going on ad infinitum. But because this is a process that tends towards infinity, but never actually gets there, there's no paradoxes involved. Now, if I... The number of cuttings, yes, is a potential infinite. Uh, the number of cuttings that have happened as of any given moment, right? Because that grows without bound and it's always finite. Uh, but it's a separate question as to whether or not the spatial regions themselves only form a potential infinite. And most philosophers think, at least in that case, uh, that he's been describing, um, if space really is indeed potentially infinitely divisible, then space is going to have to already be something like dense or continuous. And it's already going to have to have infinitely many points, or at least infinitely many spatial regions within any given region that get smaller and smaller. So that would indeed actually be an actually infinite, but you know. Half it again, and I can half it again, and I can keep going on ad infinitum. But because this is a process that tends towards infinity, but never actually gets there, there's no paradoxes involved. Now, if I keep on adding decimal points to the temperature of my coffee, as I did a moment ago, it may seem like we're dealing with a potential infinite that continually tends towards infinity, but never actually gets there. But remember, in order to avoid Parmenides' objections, we needed to say that all of the potential properties of this coffee are potential properties that are real, that it actually has right now. 
So Alex is referring to one of Fazer's favored arguments for the act potency distinction, for, for this kind of act potency pluralism, for thinking that we need to posit a way of being or a mode of existence in between full-blown actual being and sheer nothingness. And it's based on one of Parmenides' arguments. As I explain in here, the argument for the act potency distinction fails. It doesn't work. I'll link this in the description. So anyway, I'm just alerting you that this is what Alex is referring to when he's talking about uh, the reason why uh, we were positing the real existence of potentials to begin with was to basically solve Parmenides' argument against change. Uh, and what I want to say is, well, let's not take that for granted. Let's actually try to see if, firstly, if positing potencies even helps, but also let's just see if Parmenides' argument is confused on other fronts, which it is. And so no, you don't need to posit act and potency as a way to resolve the Parmenidean challenge against change. It actually has these properties, these potential properties, because otherwise, if they didn't exist, if they weren't real, they'd be nothing, and then we'd run into Parmenides' objection. That means all of these potential temperatures that my coffee could be are potentially present in the coffee all at once right now. This isn't something tending towards infinity as I count it out. These things are thought of as actually existing as potential properties of my coffee right now. So if we have to think of a potential property as a real thing in order to avoid something coming from nothing, then we would be positing that this coffee has an actually infinite number of properties which really exist, which seems to be impossible. Why does that seem to be impossible, Alex? Alex's first objection basically says the argument for motion results in two statements contradicting each other, so they can't both be true. They are actual infinities cannot exist and an actually infinite number of potentials exist. One way you could resolve this objection is by dropping the first statement. My colleague Jimmy Aiken thinks God could make an actually infinite number of objects. And so there would be no contradiction in Jimmy's case for theism if he defended the argument from motion. This objection only has force against people like me who defend both the Kalam cosmological argument for God and the argument from change or motion based on, on Aquinas. Another way to resolve the objection is to just redefine or refine what you mean by the statement an actual infinite can't exist. In the thought experiments William Lane Craig uses, what can't exist are actually infinite sets of physical objects, like books, coins, and hotel rooms. Like no, so what Craig is rejecting is the sets of anything, anything that has positive reality. He's rejecting that because it has various intolerable properties, these actually infinite collections. The whole collections can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with proper subsets thereof. That's not at all dependent on it being physical objects. Let them be non-physical minds or Cartesian egos. For Craig, you still can't have an actually infinite number of those non-physical objects because they have these various quote-unquote absurd properties. The whole collection has the, has the exact same number of members as proper parts thereof. For Craig, that is absurd. And that applies whether or not the members in the collection are physical objects or not. It also applies to non-physical objects. It applies to abstract objects. Craig is a nominalist, in part because the infinite abstract realm of propositions and mathematical objects and so on would indeed instantiate these quote-unquote absurdities, where the whole collection of them has the same number of members as proper parts thereof. So no, it doesn't just apply to physical objects, it applies to any realities. Physical objects, non-physical objects, concrete objects, abstract objects, because the relevant absurdities attending actually infinites are going to be had even in these other cases. All you need is a collection of definite and discrete members which can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. That's going to deliver you the relevant absurdities, or at least a number of the relevant absurdities, like having a whole collection which can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with proper sub-collections thereof. So no, Trent is mistaken here in saying that Craig's argument is really only applying to collections of physical things. It applies to any definite and discrete members. In Hilbert's hotel. I'm not going to get into how this is problematic for Craig's argument, because past events they're not like simultaneously existing physical objects. I do believe, however, that you could use Andrew Loke's version of the Kalam argument to show that if the past were infinite, then you could create an actual infinite set, like Hilbert's Hotel, one room at a time. So no, that version of the argument doesn't work. In my past responses to Trent, I've already made criticisms of this point. Uh, but anyway, in my previous Hilbert's Hotel video that I mentioned, the one that I recently did, a comprehensive response, uh, there's a whole section in there dedicated to this idea that you'd be able to, you know, quote unquote, construct a Hilbert's Hotel if the past were infinite. The argument fails, as I explained therein. Which would result in an actually infinite collection in the present, which is impossible. But my main point is this, it's that the problem of actual infinite sets existing may only apply to a collection of substantial beings, books, coins, hotel rooms, 
and not to potentials that exist within those substantial beings. Since no, why? Let's actually look at the absurdities attendant to Hilbert's hotel, or the alleged absurdities, to see why what uh, Trent is saying here is mistaken. So there are four distinct absurdities that allegedly attend Hilbert's Hotel. The second one, right, if one or even infinitely many new guests are accommodated in Hilbert's Hotel, there's still the same number of guests as before they arrived. This is all. This is easily going to be applying to infinite collections of potentialities. I can gain new capacities and thereby gain new potentialities. I can gain the capacity to ski. I can gain the capacity to do all sorts of things. Uh, things gain capacities all the time. Uh, and yet, given that they already have infinitely many capacities, right, infinitely many potentialities. We have new potentialities added to the collection of existent potentialities, and yet the same number of potentialities is there afterwards as was there before. And so you get this same absurdity here. Similarly, you can lose capacities, right? And so you can get the exact same quote-unquote absurdity here. So this absurdity does attend to both collections. You also have this absurdity here. It says, third, one can subtract identical quantities from identical quantities to yield divergent results. So this is basically if, you know, you had guests in rooms other than, say, the first three checked out, the hotel will be virtually emptied and only three guests would remain. Um, but then you can consider guests in every other room checking out. Well, then infinitely many guests would remain, and yet precisely the same number would have checked out. And Craig thinks that this is absurd. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, the checking out of guests is just like the losing of potentialities, right? So we could just run this argument in terms of losing potentialities, and you'd get the exact same absurdity. You can also talk, you can also cast this argument in terms of the actualization of certain potentialities. In one world, something might actualize its potential to be one foot away from something and then also actualizes potential to be three feet away from something and then also actualizes potential to be five feet away from something and then also actualizes potential to be seven feet away from something and so on ad infinitum whereas in another world this thing could actualize its potential to be one foot away from it and two feet away from it and then also three feet away from it and then also actualizes potential to be four feet away from it and then so on so in this case you have a collection of infinitely many different actualizations of potentials over the entire span of the endless future let's say and yet when we compare the first case and the second case infinitely many potentials that were present in one of them and that were actualized in one of them we're not actualized in the other. We've subtracted, as it were, infinitely many actualizations of potentials, and yet we still have a collection with infinitely many actualizations of potentials. So you get all the same alleged absurdities, you know, oh, infinity minus infinity is three, infinity minus infinity is a left null, etc. Uh, the fourth one is that Hilbert's Hotel points to a paradox involving actual infinites. So this one is basically just you can put an infinite collection in a one-to-one -one correspondence with its proper, with many of its with many of its proper sub-collections, and that that alone is absurd because it would show that proper parts can basically be the same size as their wholes. And of course, that that is the case for infinitely many potentialities, right? Their whole collection of potentialities is the exact same size as proper parts of that whole collection. So at least three out of the four absurdities that attend Hilbert's Hotel also attend uh, potentialities. So Trent's response there is just entirely mistaken. Hotel rooms, and not to potentials that exist within those substantial beings. Since potentials don't have the same kind of existence as actualized entities like hotel rooms, then there may not be- See, now you're, you're seeing why uh, this this commitment to potentialities isn't as innocuous as it might sound at the beginning. Like, yeah, people are like, oh yeah, things could possibly be different in various ways. No, Trent was here just talking about different kinds of existence. This is what you're getting yourself into when you get into this act potency distinction that you have to buy into in order to accept this argument. It's not some innocuous, pre-philosophical, obvious truth. This needs substantive argumentation, and in fact, it's a view that the vast majority of contemporary metaphysicians and philosophers reject. Ontological pluralism, that is any particular kind of ontological pluralism that uh, Trent is mentioning here. Same kind of existence as actualized entities like hotel rooms, then there may not be any problem with an actually infinite number of them existing. See, you can just blithely say, though, there may not be any problem because they're different. No, you have to see whether or not those differences are relevant to whether or not the alleged absurdities that attend Hilbert's Hotel also attend infinite collections of potentialities. And as I just explained, they aren't relevant to that because three out of the four absurdities that attend Hilbert's Hotel also attend collections of potentialities. It doesn't matter if they enjoy a different kind of existence. All that matters is that we have an infinite collection of definite and discrete members. And then you get three out of four of those absurdities. Finally, I might deny Alex's claim that an actually infinite number of potentials do exist. According to Thomistic metaphysics, a potential can't exist on its own. A potential represents a capacity of a substance. So for example, the potential for the warmth of the coffee can't exist apart from actual coffee. But in the example Alex gives, there's only one potential. 
the potential for the coffee to be a certain temperature. No, so there. I mean, this goes into how we are, are kind of identity conditions for potentialities and how we individuate them from one another. But I don't think there's only one potential there. It's a distinct potential to be 70 degrees from a potential to be 30 degrees, let's say. And to see this, just notice that someone can have one of those potentials without having another of those potentials. So uh, a human, for instance, might have the potentiality to be 70 degrees. Let's suppose that humans don't die until they get down to like 50 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Suppose if humans die, when it comes to 50 degrees, but they can still survive at least a short period of time at 70 degrees. But of course they can't, let's suppose that they can't survive a short period of time at 30 degrees. Well, then a human can have the potential to exist at 70 degrees or to be have a temperature, internal temperature of 70 degrees, but they don't have the potential to be at 30 degrees and so on. So this shows that these potentials are different because one can have one without having the other. So no, it's not just some vague indeterminate potential to be at some different number of degrees. No, these are indeed distinct potentials because one thing can have one of them without having another of them. Moreover, I think they need to be distinct potentials in order to do the relevant explanatory heavy lifting with being able to account for change, and in particular, the particular changes that go on. So if we only describe the situation of the cup, or I guess the water in the cup or whatever, the coffee in the cup, if we only described it as having the potentiality to have a different temperature or something like that, then we're unable to explain when it does have a precise temperature that it changes to, we're unable to explain why it went to that particular temperature. After all, it didn't have a potential to go to that particular temperature, it just had a potential, a vague indeterminate potential to be at a different temperature. We're unable to explain then why it goes at that particular temperature rather than some other particular temperature metaphysically explained that is. We are also unable to explain why it went to that particular temperature rather than just being vaguely and indeterminately at a different range of temperatures. Because the potential here is just as Trent was just describing it. It's a vague and indeterminate potential to have a quote unquote different temperature. It seems we need to postulate particular potentials corresponding to those particular temperatures that it might go to in order to explain why it is even able, even capable of going to those particular temperatures rather than merely existing in almost like a quantumly indeterminate state of a different temperature without any particular temperature at which it exists. Again, we need to be able to metaphysically explain this. That's the whole task of positing potentialities. But if you only posit potentialities that aren't specific like that, well, then it seems as though you don't have that explanation. The coffee has one potential for temperature. And that potential comes in a variety of degrees. Then you can just focus on those different degrees. How many are there? Actually, infinitely many different degrees. And then you can, you know, you can look at the different degrees, show that they put in one-to-one -one correspondence with proper subcollections of those individual degrees, and so on. So he still hasn't avoided an actually infinite collection here. So even if he made this response to get around the points that I was just making about, you know, the individuation conditions for potentialities, he's still going to be saddled with an actually infinite collection. Now he could, of course, try to argue that temperature is discrete rather than continuous, or those sorts of things. But firstly, that's controversial, and he would have to prove that. But secondly, you can focus on other potentialities that don't involve continuous quantities. So for instance, the potential to be one foot away from me, the potential to be two feet away from me, the potential to be three feet away from me, the potential to be four feet away from me, the cup is going to have all these potentialities for each natural number. And so it's still going to have infinitely many potentialities. Similarly, the cup has the potential to exist for one more day, the potential to exist for two more days, the potential to exist for three more days, the potential to exist for four more days, and so on ad infinitum. And so going that route of just making it discrete quantities won't actually help. In Thomistic metaphysics, we would distinguish a potential that has existence in a substance from just a bare possibility. However, even if you think the specific degrees of temperature the coffee can be each represent a potential, we have to remember that potentials are not unlimited. Alex even admits that, even admits that when he says coffee doesn't have the potential to become a chicken. Potentials are restricted to the nature of a substance. Again, this just strikes me as completely irrelevant. Even if they're restricted to the nature of the substance, we can just focus on the various potentials and capacities that it, that it has within the bounds of its nature that are indeed infinite in number, like existing one more day, or existing two more days, or existing three more days, and so on. That's perfectly compatible with our nature, as Trent himself thinks that we can go on in an endless afterlife. We have the potential to exist for one more day, we have the potential to exist for two more days, we have the potential to exist for three more days, and so on. So this point about potentials not being unlimited and being restricted to you know, the natures of substances and so on, it just strikes me as completely irrelevant. Now, granted, you could take the atoms in coffee and maybe rearrange them into a chicken, but now it's not the coffee as coffee that has a potential to become a chicken. In a similar way, coffee as coffee 
just might be unable to achieve an infinitely precise temperature, like 60.1111111 repeating one degrees. That's not what he needs. So no, you don't need infinitely precise temperatures. You only need finitely many precise temperatures, but you just need infinitely many finitely precise temperatures, right? So a temperature of one, a temperature of 1.1, a temperature of 1.11, a temperature of 1.111. Notice that none of these, I repeat, none of these have an infinitely precise temperature. All of them only have finitely many decimal points. And yet there are infinitely many of those things that have finitely many decimal points. He's not addressing the case as Alex stated it. Alex's case does not have infinitely precise temperatures. His point is that there are infinitely many different finitely precise temperatures. Because coffee's nature is restricted by the behavior of its atomic structure. There may be some temperatures the coffee can't reach because those temperatures are more precise than the number of atoms in the coffee itself. Yeah, so this is a different point than the one that he was just making about infinite precision. Now he's saying, I'm trying to charitably interpret him here, even if they're all finite, there may be some finite bound beyond which, you know, it's just too precise that it can't get there. Uh, so that's a different point than the one that he was just making. He, he was just making earlier that uh, it would need to be infinitely precise. You need like, for instance, infinitely many ones. That's not true. So this is a distinct point. I just want to emphasize that. But now notice that firstly, Trent is just saying, oh, maybe that's not the case. Well, listen, the burden of proof here is on the proponent of the first way and the Aristotelian proof. And so they're the ones who need to positively show that they're not susceptible to this objection. And so they're the ones who need to positively show that uh, the, the temperature couldn't be that precise. There, there must be some finite bound at the end. And so Trent is here just suggesting, oh, maybe that's the case. Well, no, that's not going to do it. You need to positively justify that that is the case. That's one thing to say. But the second thing to say is that, again, we're getting bogged down in the details of this. You, we don't need to focus on temperature in the cup. Even if Trent is correct here, just focus on a, di a different substance with different potentialities that don't have to be infinitely precise or that don't have to uh, be super duper duper finitely precise. Focus again on me. I can exist for one more day. I can exist for two more days. I can exist for three more days. I can exist for four more days. I can exist for five more days and so on for each natural number n. And so that completely avoids the point about infinite precision. It completely avoids the point about there being some finite level of precision beyond which it's simply not possible, etc. So again, we're getting too bogged down in the particularities of this example. The, the more general point remains that you're going to be saddled with infinitely many potentialities. And we could say the same thing for other examples that involve thinking of an infinite number of logically possible changes in a thing that aren't actually metaphysically possible given the thing's nature. Right, but in all the cases that I just mentioned, they are metaphysically possible. Since substantial beings are finite in their nature, it would follow that their natures only allow for a finite number of potentials to be actualized. So that just strikes me as untrue. I just gave, I mean, I just gave an example where there are infinitely many different finite finite potentials, right? So it's a finite potential that I go on existing for two days. There's a finite potential that I go on for existing three days. There's a finite potential that I go on existing for four days, and so on. There are infinitely many of those finite potentials. None of this compromises my status as a finite being. So it doesn't follow from the fact that I'm a finite being that I can't have infinitely many potentials, contrary to what Trent just said. So to summarize, this objection doesn't work against people who think actual infinites can exist? That is a spot-on response to what Alex said. I mean, it is a philosophically significant point that if you can show that these views would commit you to the existence of actually infinite collections of definite and discrete members. But again, a lot of philosophers, most philosophers are just going to be like, yeah, so what? All right, so I did want to add here that Alex's point can be bolstered by parsimony considerations. So if we just think that it's a mark against a theory that it has to postulate literally infinitely many realities corresponding to these potentialities that like any substance has, for instance, any spatial substance. So my ball here, which I'm going to pick up, my ball here is going to have infinitely many potentialities. I'm going to have infinitely many potentialities. That stick there on the ground is going to have infinitely many potentialities. Basically, for anything that you can pick out, it's going to have infinitely many potentialities. These are real existent bits of reality for the Aristotelian Thomist. And so arguably, it's a mark against a theory that it has to postulate infinitely many potentialities. Like, that is just a monstrous violation of Occam's razor and parsimony considerations, arguably. And so to bolster Alex's point, you could just say that all else being equal, this is a significant mark against a view which posits these potentialities. So yeah, this ball here has a potential to go into the back of the net, and that potential became actual. Uh, also, potentials exist in a different way than actualized objects exist, so the rule against actual infinities may not apply to potentials.
credentials. And there are two broad responses to this. Firstly, it doesn't matter if they exist in a different way. All that matters is that they exist. And so then you can number them. And so then you can show that they have at least three out of the four of the alleged absurdities attending Hilbert's Hotel. So the quote unquote rule against actual infinites does indeed apply to them. So that's the first response. But secondly, it's not enough for Trent merely to say, oh, it may not apply to them. No, the onus of justification here is on the proponent of the Aristotelian proof, is on the proponent of the first way. So if it is indeed intolerably problematic for there to be actual infinites. They're the ones who need to show positively that their commitments do not involve a commitment to these infinitely many distinct potentialities. And it seems plausible that no actual infinite number of potentials even exist, given the restrictions on potentiality that are found in the limited natures of created finite things. And as I explained, it's perfectly compatible with my nature being limited that I have infinitely many different potentialities. In fact, that limits me in various different ways. Potentialities themselves for Aristotelian Thomists are limiting. So if I have all the more potentialities, like infinitely many, that means I'm infinitely limited, right? It's precisely because for them, God is purely actual, that God is unlimited, right? Potentialities are the things that limit. So if I have infinitely many potentialities, that just means I'm infinitely limited. The second problem is one that was raised by the atheist philosopher Graham Oppie while he was discussing this very argument with Ed Fazer himself, something that you can watch on the Capturing Christianity YouTube channel. Oppie simply grants that change is the actualization of potential, but he points out that the reverse is not true. Not all actualization of potential is change. He provides the example of a chair, like the chair that I'm sat on right now. Now this chair is yellow. This chair has the potential to become blue, say, if somebody were to reupholster it, but it also seems to have the potential to remain yellow. That is, things that are actual seem to have the potential to simply remain as they are. If they don't have this potential, then they wouldn't be able to remain as they are, and so they would stop existing. And therefore, actual things will always have at least one kind of potential, which is the potential to remain as they are. But now listen to what Ben correctly says about the first cause established by the argument from change. There has to be one prime cause. That cause can't have any potential. Because if it had potential, something else could activate it into changing. So there's one unchanging cause that is purely actual. The god that Ben is talking about has to be something that has no potential whatsoever. But as I've just argued, unless god is about to stop existing, he must have at least one kind of potential, which is the potential to remain as he is, to remain in existence. I'm sorry, my head is in my hands right now. No, if the god that he's arguing for is purely actual, then it's going to be timeless. Right? If it were temporal, if it were undergoing succession, then it would have potentials to change. And so it wouldn't be purely actual. And so it's not temporal. It doesn't undergo succession. It's timeless. But then it doesn't have quote unquote potentials to like persist or to remain in existence like moment after moment because it's timeless. So no, it, this purely actual being wouldn't have to have potentials. Now, I think a better case to be made here, here's an interesting dilemma. You can either go a tensed or a tenseless view of time. You can either have this kind of objective becoming or you don't. If you don't have objective becoming, then change is not the actualization of potential, as I explained earlier, and so the argument fails. But if you do have objective temporal becoming, then there won't be able to be a purely actual God. Why is that? Well, because in objective temporal becoming, right, you have things genuinely coming into existence, going out of existence, and hence you have truths genuinely changing their truth value, namely truths about what there is. So for instance, that dinosaurs exist, that truth, at some point was true, but then it became false as dinosaurs went out of existence. Similarly, that humans exist was once false, go back 5 million years or something. And then now it's true, right? So it became true. But of course, knowledge is factive, right? You can't know something that's false. And so if the truths themselves change, then any knowledge of the truths must itself likewise change. It has to change to track the truths. So back 5 million years ago, when it was false that there are humans, no one could have known that there are humans because it was objectively false. Now, when it's true that there are humans, anyone who's omniscient in particular would have to know that it is in fact true. So go back 5 million years ago, an omniscient being did not know 5 million years ago that there are humans because it was false and you can only know something that's true. But now an omniscient being must know it. So any omniscient being must have gone from not knowing that there are humans to knowing that there are humans. That is a change. And so this timeless being, this uh, quote unquote purely actual omniscient being, this purely actual omniscient God would have to have minimally, under a dynamic view of time, would have to have minimally potentials to acquire and lose knowledge. There's some kind of before or after or succession in its life, right? It has to go from not knowing something to knowing it. And in particular, it has to go from not knowing that humans exist when it's false to knowing that humans exist when it's true. 
I actually defend that argument in my uh, forthcoming manuscript, and I go through different responses that have been given, etc. So, I mean, Alex might be, you know, hinting at something here, which is a very serious challenge. But as he stated it, it seems to me to just be thoroughly wrongheaded. So, yeah, in, in short, there's a dilemma, right? You either go a tenseless, or, you know, you go a view of time which doesn't have objective temporal becoming, or you go a view of time which does have objective temporal becoming. If you go the tenseless route, the no objective temporal becoming route, then the argument fails, the Aristotelian argument, the argument from change, etc., because then change is not the actualization of potential. But if you go this uh, dynamic view of time route, well, then the argument also fails, because the quote-unquote God that it would deliver could not be purely actual. It would have to have minimally potentials to acquire knowledge or to lose knowledge, etc. I go over this in other videos of mine that I've done with Ryan Mullins, and like I said, I go over this in, I've also gone over this in blog posts, I address re responses, etc., so if you're curious, check out that. So the purely actual God with no potential that Ben thinks he's proven may not actually be able to exist at all. Alex's next argument seems to be this. Premise one, in order to exist, a thing must have the potential to remain in existence as it is or to continue to exist without change. Premise two, God is purely actual and has no potential. Premise three, therefore, God does not have the potential to remain in existence as it is or to continue to exist without change. Therefore, God does not exist. Now, the problem with this argument is with the first premise. It basically assumes this principle. Whatever is actual must have a potential to remain actual. But Alex has not offered sufficient justification for such a broad principle. To see why, consider this objection to a basic version of the cosmological argument for God's existence. Premise one, in order to exist, a thing must have a cause. Premise two, God is uncaused. Three, therefore, well, what's wrong with this argument as a cause? This may be true for things that begin to exist or don't have to exist. Moved is pulled by another. This is true of every car on the train, except for the locomotive. In fact, you need a car on the train that gives motion to the train, but does not receive motion from another car to explain why the train moves at all. And this brings us to Alex's objection to the argument for motion. Just because some things have a potential, just because some things have a potential to remain in existence, it doesn't follow that all things have this potential. To see why Alec is overgeneralizing, listen again to his claim. Things that are actual seem to have the potential to simply remain as they are. If they don't have this potential, then they wouldn't be able to remain as they are, and so they would stop existing. And therefore, actual things will always have at least one kind of potential, which is the potential to remain as they are. But notice that we can replace all of the terms and get the faulty objection to the cosmological argument. It's the same as saying this. Things that exist seem to have a cause, because if they don't have a cause, then they wouldn't be able to exist, and so they would never start existing. Therefore, existing things will always have a cause. Okay, so something that just came to mind. Uh, Alex sort of framed this at the beginning as if this was Oppie's objection. This was not Oppie's objection, okay? Oppie did not make this sort of uh, mistake that, that Trent and I are pointing out in Alex. Um, yeah, no, that was not Oppie's point. Oppie's point was explicitly restricted to temporal things. And Oppie was pointing out that potentials to remain unchanged are different from potentials to change uh, in the case of temporal things. And Oppie's ultimately getting there at existential inertia. This is not Oppie's criticism. I can guarantee you that. Go and read Oppie's paper that he published in Religious Studies and go and listen to the original discussion that Oppie had with Phaser. Uh, the way that Alex characterized it is not uh, Oppie's criticism. Just as the principle everything has a cause is only true of contingent things, the principle whatever is actual has potential to be actual is only true of things that are a mixture of potential and actual. The first principle does not apply to uncaused things, and the second principle does not apply to purely actual things. In the example that Alex cites, it's true that nothing about the chair's color changes when its potential to stay yellow is actualized. But the ongoing yellow state of affairs still represents a reduction of potential to actual that requires something else to actualize it. No, I mean, I would just say it only requires an explanation. There are boatloads of existential inertialist friendly ex explanations that don't cite an external sustaining cause that keeps it in existence. You can see, for instance, my blog post that I showed earlier, So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia, for uh, a variety of these existential inertia friendly accounts. And also check out my forthcoming book. This becomes more evident when we look at the property of the chair's existence. Something else must actualize the chair's potential to exist, not just at this moment, but at any moment, including any moment into the future. Now, I know that Oppie and other critics like him might appeal to existential inertia to explain the chair's continued existence apart from other actualizers. 
Uh, so existential inertia doesn't really itself explain its continued existence. Existential inertia is just a thesis. It's a thesis that purports to describe the manner in which things persist. Namely, they persist without some kind of external sustenance or c continuous conservation from without. That's not an explanation of why it persists. An explanation for why it persists would cite or appeal to various existential inertia friendly explanations of persistence. So again, it's in section five here that I go through various different accounts uh, of existential inertia. So existential inertia friendly explanations of persistence. But since Alex didn't raise that particular objection in this in his video, I'm going to pass over it for now. But perhaps we can revisit it in a future video. Well, not sure if I want that to happen. <laughs> We're going to have to get another response to Trent Horn if that happens. In the universe, God is timeless or eternal. God doesn't exist in time in a way that makes it so that he requires some potential to remain in existence. The philosopher Boethius defined God's eternity not as endless existence in time. That's the eternal life we will have in heaven, but it's not God's eternity. Boethius defined God's eternity as the, quote, simultaneously full and perfect possession of endless life. God's eternity means he exists in one perfect timeless act where he has the simultaneously full and perfect possession of endless life. If God had a potential to exist, that would mean there was a time when God did not exist that was later actualized. But that's impossible because God has the simultaneously full and perfect possession of endless life. Now, this is not a case of special pleading, as if we were saying everything has a cause except for God because he's God. Instead, it just logically follows that if there is change or potential reduced to the actual, then this changing series can only be explained by that which is purely actual. And that is just straightforwardly false. Which we recognize as God. <laughs> which we do not recognize as God. It's much more plausibly taken to be an impersonal first principle. Also, God being purely actual is the only explanation for the existence of every other actualizer. That's just not true, but okay. Just as the locomotive, as an unpulled puller, is the only thing that explains why the other train cars move at all. Yeah, so that just means you need something that is an uncaused cause, that is uh, has the ability to cause other things, which doesn't need a cause in itself. But e even if something is a mixture of act and potency, it doesn't follow that it needs a cause in itself. For instance, you could have a timeless, necessarily existent, perfect God that just has potentials for cross-world variants. It has potentials, for instance, for different intrinsic belief states and so on. Obviously, such a God would not require a cause. It's the necessary and perfect and unlimited foundation of everything else. And yet it would still be a mixture of act and potency. And so you don't need to be a purely actual thing in order to serve as an uncaused cause. That's the basic point. My third objection is that the argument from change may only work on an A theory of time. The A theory of time posits that the present is all that exists. The past and the future, in other words, don't exist. There's just the present. The B theory of time, on the other hand, posits that the past and the future both exist just like the present does, that they all exist in one big time block. It can be a little bit weird to get your head around, but on the B theory of time, it's often suggested that objects, as well as having three spatial dimensions, also have a fourth temporal dimension that stretches across this time block. Of course, we're only able to see one point of this dimension, but the past cup and the future cup both exist just like the present one does. The only thing that makes this part of the cup, the present cup, is that the person calling it the present cup occupies the same place on the time block as this particular part of the cup. So on this view, you are right now looking at a different part of the cup than you were a moment ago, because the cup has a real unobservable, but real dimension that stretches through time. And what you think of as the present cup and the future cup are actually just different parts of this same cup along that temporal dimension. Thus the potential cup, the cold cup, and the actual cup, the hot cup, are actually just the same cup. And these words merely describe different points along this temporal dimension. But all of these points exist all in the same way. And if you were able to step outside of the time block, you'd see them all at once. If this is the case, then calling something potential simply because it exists at a different point on the time block to me, and actual when it exists at the same point, would be like me calling the coffee potential because it was in a different room in the house where I can't see it, and actual when it happens to be in front of me. This is a misleading description of what's actually going on. So if the potential coffee and the actual coffee are actually both just different parts of the same coffee that you could see as one big block if you were outside of time, then the distinction between potential and actual is no longer a property of the coffee, but a property of the observer and which point of the coffee's temporal dimension they happen to be looking at. Now, if this is the case, if this is an accurate description of... Under a 
tenseless view of time or like a four dimensionalist eternalist view of time uh, what i would say is that no like the potential it's not as though the potentials are like existing for the observer the observer him or herself is also entirely actual along each of those particular points right so the observer themselves doesn't have any potentials at one time that become actual that transition to a state of actuality and if we were to look from outside of time we'd see that there's no such thing as real change because the past the present and no. the future cup but all simply exist all at once in front of us on this time block no there would be change Clearly there's change. You cannot deny that there is change. There is variance in properties over time. At one point my shirt is red, at another point it's yellow because someone spilled the mustard on it. Let's let's pretend that it was mustard. <laughs> Obviously there's change in all of this. It's just how are we to analyze change? For what it's worth, Ed Faser actually discusses this very objection, and specifically the view that Einstein's relativity theory points to a B theory rather than an A theory of time. Alex's final concern. We actually address what uh, Phaser says uh, in that chapter there and uh, talking about absolute simultaneity and so on. We address that in our uh, forthcoming book manuscript. Deals with the B theory of time. This basically challenges the first premise of the argument or that change is real. If time is just another dimension. See, I don't blame Trent here, but uh, Alex should have been much clearer. It's not challenging the view that change is real. Like change is obviously still real. It's variance in properties over the along the temporal dimension. So change is obviously real and it's still real under a B theory of time. What it's challenging is another premise in the argument, namely that change is the actualization of potential because all the times are equally actual and all the contents of times are equally actual. And so there's no sense in which one of them is potential and then transitions to a state of actuality. And so change would not be analyzed correctly as the actualization of potential of space and all moments of time are equally real, then it, maybe it's the case that change is an illusion and it doesn't have to be explained. Nothing ever goes from potential to actual because all moments of time are actual or equally real. As one physicist puts it, actuality through and through. Now, I'm grateful that Alex actually engages Ed Fazer's reply to this objection, and Alex was gracious enough to share this reply with me that he originally saved for his patrons. Uh, he didn't include it in the original video. So let's take a look at it, and in doing so, I'm going to be drawing from some of the replies Ed Fazer gives in his article, Actuality, Potentiality, and Relativity's Block Universe. You can find that in the 2018 anthology, Neo-Aristotelian Perspectives on Contemporary Science. For what it's worth, Ed Fazer actually discusses this very objection, and specifically the view that Einstein's relativity theory points to a B theory rather than an A theory of time. Phaser offers three considerations. The first is that this interpretation of relativity, that it points to a B theory of time, is controversial, but that's not particularly important. Second, he argues that... Yeah, and also it's kind of irrelevant to point out that it's controversial, right? The onus of justification here is on Phaser to positively rule out the view. If the view does indeed, if true, challenge one of Phaser's premises, then the onus of justification is on Phaser to positively prove that the view is false, not just to note, oh, it's controversial, oh, you know, those sorts of things. No, he needs to positively show that it's false. So that, that first reply is mistaken. Science itself, quote, including relativity theory, rests on the empirical evidence of observation and experiment, which involves scientists having certain experiences. Of course, in coming up with a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis, and proving a scientific theory, a scientist changes from a state of ignorance to one of knowledge. Therefore, says Faser, the very process of science itself is an example of change. And so trying to use science to prove that change is illusory is self-defeating. That's not... Oh, my goodness. The whole framing of this is, is very frustrating. Properly understood, the objection in question does not challenge the reality of change. There is obviously change around us. At one point, a tree was a sapling, and then at another point, at a later point, it's a tree. That is change. No one should be denying the reality of change here. The question is, how do we metaphysically analyze this datum, this datum of change? There's one way to analyze it as the actualization of potential. Something is in a state of potentiality and then it transitions to or becomes actual. It transitions to a state of actuality. Another way of analyzing that does away with that analysis and instead holds that both the terminus and the beginning of the relevant processes of change exist, but the change consists in the variance of properties along that temporal dimension. At one point, the tree is 100 feet tall. At another point, it's one foot tall, etc. So, of course, scientists, in coming up with their theories and so on, have to have various experiences. And those experiences are do indeed involve change, right? At one point in time, they experience such and such, and then at a later point, they experience a different such and such. So, yeah, I mean, if you're saying that change is non-existent, 
then our sense experience would be radically illusory in that sense. And so, yes, that would indeed be self-defeating. But properly understood, the objection in question is not saying that there is no change. It's analyzing change differently than how the Aristotelian Thomist might analyze it, or differently than how the tensed theorist would analyze it. But this seems to me to beg the question against change. If relativity implies a B-theory of time, and B-theory implies that change doesn't really exist, then it would simply be the case that what appears to be a scientist changing his mind is actually just two parts of the same scientist that both exist on the time block. That is the scientist changing his mind. The scientist obviously changes their mind in the situation here. They have a particular state of mind, and then later they have a different state of mind. It's just you're analyzing the change differently, as at one point having certain properties and then at a later point having other properties. This is perfectly compatible with uh, the scientist, you know, having reliable sense experience and so on, and the scientist accurately latching on to the Geiger counter or whatever, or the pressure gauge at that particular time and then at a later time and then reasoning through that. None of that defeats the reliability of our sense experience and so on. The sense experience there is still perfectly reliable. Again, change still exists on this. The tree is still out there. The pressure gauge is still there. It's still reading exactly what it does. The person is appropriately causally latched on to the, uh, the Geiger counter's readings and so on. The scientist's faculties are perfectly reliable. They're functioning properly. None of this is self-defeating. One temporal part of the scientist is ignorant. Another temporal part of the scientist is knowledgeable. To say, as Phaser does, that the scientist becoming knowledgeable shows that change exists is to say that once the knowledgeable scientist exists, the ignorant scientist no longer exists which is, of course, to assume the A theory of time, because it says that the past doesn't exist anymore, thus just assuming that B theory is false, which is why I think it's begging the question. If we accept the B theory of time and accept that the scientist has a real temporal dimension, then his ignorance and his knowledge are both just parts of him at different points along this temporal dimension, and both just as real as each other. Viewed from outside of time, there would be no changing in the scientist's mind at all. Only one part of the scientist who's ignorant and another part of the same scientist who's knowledgeable. And it would all just be before us all at once. Phaser's objection is that science undermines itself when it's used to show there is no change. Because science depends on thinking processes like reasoning that leads to change in our minds. In other words, if I think change is real, then it is self-refuting to try to convince me change is not real through arguments that are meant to change my mind through a reasoning process. Let's just keep in mind that all of this is perfectly compatible with four-dimensionalist eternalism, as I've been explaining. Even if the universe's physical structure were unchanging, we would still have to explain the change that takes place in our immaterial consciousness that persists in the block universe. We also need to remember that just because science uses a certain model to represent the world, it does not follow that something does not exist just because it's not in that model. Science Use. Such a silly inference is not what the sophisticated defenders of, for instance, a B-theoretic four-dimensionalist eternalism argue. They argue, for instance, on the basis of the inadequacies of the neo-Lorentzian interpretation. They argue from the success of treating space and time as a unit in general relativity. They argue from the success of that in the predictive and explanatory payoffs of general relativity. And they argue that that gives us good metaphysical reason to think that this uh, general relativity is accurately capturing uh, the real structure of reality when it unites space and time into this four-dimensional manifold and so on. So they're not making that you know silly inference from just because something isn't contained in our representations and so on that it's therefore not in reality. Formulas in physics, for example, account for the world without referring to conscious thoughts. And maybe one day those formulas could predict everything that will happen without ever referencing our conscious thoughts. But in either case, it does not follow we aren't conscious just because our consciousness doesn't show up in physics textbooks. It's also the case that something could be in a physical model of the universe, but not exist in reality. For example, an engineer might perfectly design a plane to fly based on the passengers in his model all having an average weight of 179.6 pounds, even if no one on the plane ends up weighing exactly 179.6 pounds. So we need to keep a perspective on what physics does and does not prove. But let's talk more about the theories of time in Alex's objection. The A theory of time does not say that once the knowledgeable scientist exists, the ignorant scientist stops existing as if they were two different people. Rather, the present moment when a scientist becomes knowledgeable is real, and the moment when that same scientist was ignorant, it no longer exists in the present. But the same scientist still exists, and he has undergone a change in his thinking. 
In response, Alex says that under the B theory of time, there is simply one part, one part of the scientist at time one that is ignorant, and another part of the scientist at a later time, time two, that has knowledge, but no change. That's where Alex goes wrong. That's what change consists in for the, the B theoretic eternalist. Why does the scientist suddenly have knowledge at time two, unless something about him or her, something about that particular scientist, changed between time one and time two? Right. Things happened between time one and time two. Even if all those exist, there are still events going on at those different times, right? And so that can account for why you have this variance over the over time, right? Because the, the scientists looked at the pressure gauge or whatever, and then as a you know a temporally extended process, photons bounced off that, reached his retina. So again, all of this is still perfectly kosher within the uh, four-dimensionalist, B-theoretic, eternalist kind of view. For example, imagine Bob reasons at time one, if I think, I exist. I think. Then a moment later, he thinks at time two, the conclusion, I exist. It seemed like Bob has reasoned to the conclusion and, under, and underwent a mental change. But now imagine we have Bob and Fred. At time one, Bob thinks, if I think, I exist. And I think. But then he doesn't finish his thought. He gets distracted. A moment later, Fred randomly thinks, I exist. In both cases, the thoughts appear at the same points in the block universe. But they don't represent the same scenario. We don't think Fred reasoned to the conclusion just because Bob had reasoning a moment before him that logically fits in the block universe, because Bob and Fred are, are different people. Fred didn't do the reasoning. But then why think Bob reasoned to the conclusion in the other example if the Bob who reasons at time one is not the same person as the Bob who reasons at time two? So this is just personal identity. All you need is a grounding of personal identity over time in order to explain this. Maybe there are certain appropriate causal connections connecting this uh, time slice with this time slice, or this time slice of uh, this thing and the time slice of this thing, such that this person is the same person as this one. Maybe there's relevant psychological continuity between them that isn't the case with the with the other person. Maybe there's some further fact view. Maybe this person has an immaterial soul that uh, has a particular you know time slice here and then a time slice here and so on. Maybe it's that you have a physical continuity view, right? So this person over here was not physically continuous to this person. And you can have boatloads of different views uh, combined with either four-dimensionalist, B-theoretic eternalism, or some atheoretic view. All you need is some grounding of the uh, identity over time of this person with this person, like it's the same person, or at least, you know, this two different parts of the same person. And again, how are you going to secure that? You're just going to look to the exa exact same theories that are developed even in the case of a theory. You're going to look at psychological continuity, maybe physical continuity, maybe a further fact view. Maybe there are certain causal connections that, that do it, etc. Here's how Phaser puts it. If the person who had the second thought were not the same as the person who had the first one, there would not be any reasoning going on, any more than there would be if, say, Donald Trump had had the conscious thought that if P, then Q, and P, and Hillary Clinton had a moment later, by sheer coincidence, the conscious thought that Q. And again, I don't think any of this gives a particularly serious challenge to the B-theoretic eternalist view. Uh, the, the time slice, a moment later, is a time slice of the same person as the moment earlier, and so this counts as a reasoning process of that particular person. In virtue of any of these other facts that I just mentioned, maybe it's psychological continuity, maybe it's physical continuity, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a combination of some of these, maybe there's a further fact view, and so on down the list of the countless different theories that have been developed of personal identity. None of this is a serious challenge to four-dimensionalist eternalism. Again, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton aren't going to satisfy those criteria. They're certainly psychologically discontinuous. They're certainly physically discontinuous. They don't have the same soul, etc. Again, these are different views. I'm not saying I accept any individual one. I'm just pointing out that, like, this isn't a problem for four-dimensionalist B-theoretic eternalism. Now, Alex might say it is the same person having these thoughts, but the person has not changed. This person just has one temporal part of him that thinks of the beginning of the argument, while another temporal part of him thinks of the conclusion, but he does not change in this process. But Again, yes, there is change in this process because it's variance over the temporal dimension. Temporal parts don't have relations like spatial parts. The existence of the fair-skinned parts of my body are not dependent on the existence of the darker parts of my skin. But these are different spatial parts that are not directly related to one another. They don't depend on each other for their existence. But the temporal parts with conclusions about the world are dependent on the temporal parts that have reasons about the world that came prior. But if they're... Right, so that's exactly what the B-theoretic eternalist 
can appeal to, right? There is a relevant dependence relation and psychological continuity between one time slice and another such that that legitimizes saying that this is an extended process of reasoning rather than like one person saying if P then Q and then another person saying P and then a still third person saying Q. That of course isn't reasoning. But you still have reasoning going on in the case of the B-theoretic eternalist view because you do have these relevant connections of dependence and relevant psychological continuity. There is no logical connection between these two parts, like a person following rules of inference to get from P to Q. And instead, they're just, ran they're just randomly connected events. Then we have no reason to trust any conclusions we reach, since we didn't reason our way through them. Yes, if they're just randomly connected like that, you know, there, there, isn't, there isn't a relevant psychological continuity between them, there isn't a relevant dependence between these different time slices and so on. Yes, then of course it's going to be unreliable. But that's not a commitment of the B-theoretic eternalist view. And this includes any reasoning towards the view that there is no change at all. In fact, I don't see anything implausible with saying that even if change in the physical structure of the block universe is an illusion, which I don't accept, but even if that were true, you could still say the conscious mind interprets the changes as different events and it changes. This would be similar to how the mind perceives motion in a flip book, even if the horse in a flip book isn't actually running. None of the pictures in the flip book change, but our minds are changing as we observe the flip book. And even if the B theory of time is true, it doesn't detract from the truth that some potential in our consciousness is actualized by observing the universe. And this actualization needs an explanation. No, so it, it certainly does challenge that because your psychological process is itself a temporally extended process and all the different temporal portions of it are equally actual. And so yes, your psychological process does change here, but what does that change consist in? It consists in the variance under this view. It consists in the variance along that temporal dimension, the variance in properties along that temporal dimension. So no, in that case, you don't have potentials, even in the case of consciousness, right? All the different portion, temporal portions of the consciousness are equally actual. There's no portion which is like somehow in a state of potentiality and then it transitions to a state of actuality or becomes actual under this sort of view. So yes, there are psychological changes going on here, but the changes are analyzed in a way that doesn't involve the actualization of a potential. And this actualization needs an explanation. And the argument for motion shows this explanation can't be an infinite series of actualizers. It has to terminate in that which is purely actual. So it most certainly doesn't have to terminate in that which is purely actual. I don't think Trent has adequately responded to the worry. And third response to this objection is that even if change within the universe is illusory, and it all is just one big time block that doesn't actually involve any change through time, there are still forms of actualizing potential that exist outside of or insensitive to the passage of time. Fazer writes, as I have argued, it's not just a thing's undergoing change that involves the actualization of potential, but its very existence at any moment that involves the actualization of potential. Hence, even if there is no real change or actualization of potential within an Einsteinian four-dimensional block universe, the sheer existence of that universe as a whole, in a single timeless moment as it were, would involve the actualization of potential and thus an actualizer distinct from the world itself. Now there's actually something that's quite seriously wrong with what he's saying here, and it's that the very fact that change isn't analyzed as an actualization of potential might very well give us an undercutting defeater for thinking that act and potency are a way of carving up reality at all, right? As Fazer argues earlier on in this chapter, it's in large part precisely because there's change going on that we justifiably, by his lights, Phaser's lights, accept and posit the act-potency distinction. But if we remove that justification by going this Einsteinian four-dimensional block route, well then we've just lost one of the major justifications for even positing act and potency to begin with at all, ever. <laughs> and so in that case, we start to have an undercutting defeater for even thinking that uh, the very existence of things at any moment involves the actualization of potential. So that's something that is important to note. If you kind of, you're almost like climbing up a ladder and then you're kind of like kicking the ladder out from under you. It's like what was precisely supposed to be justifying you in thinking that there is act and potency was this analysis of change and the you know, looking at changes around us and so on. Uh, and then you go on to apply that to existence, which is what uh, Phaser did. But then if you start to jettison that ladder, if you kick out that ladder for, out from under you, the very thing that justified you in thinking that uh, there is this act and potency and that that carves reality at its joints, if you start to jettison that by saying, okay, well, fine, we're not going to say that uh, that's the way to understand change, well, then you've lost your justification for p positing this distinction to begin with. Now, of course, I'm not saying that, you know, that's the only justification, but it is the main one that Phaser offers in his book here. That's something that I think Phaser's point here completely misses.
Of course, that actualizer is the god that we're talking about. But do note that once we remove this temporal element of actualizing potential, we're no longer talking about the argument from change. Instead, Phaser is talking about the actualization of potential that isn't change. Even if, Phaser says, the universe exists as one big block timelessly on the B theory of time, it's still actual. That universe still actually exists. It's not just potential. So it requires something to actualize it, even if timelessly. But now, remember earlier Graham Oppie's point that actual things have the potential to remain as they are. Now, I said that this is a problem because it precludes the possibility of a purely actual thing. So suppose we take Alex's criticism there seriously, the one where he was saying, you know, uh, anything that exists has to have the potential to remain as it is. Well, then that would also be applying to the four dimensional space time block. So then would that ha somehow have the potential to like remain as, as it is at the quote unquote next moment? Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? The next moment that it, that's only a concept that applies within the spatio temporal block, right? It doesn't apply to the spatio temporal block as a whole. And so the spatio temporal block as a whole does not have the potential to sort of remain unchanged, you know, to kind of persist to the next moment. But then Alex's claim earlier on, as he said, anything that there is has to have this potential to remain unchanged. Uh, but no, not if you take this criticism that you've been developing. Because it needs the potential to remain as it is, at least. Now, you may have thought of a response to this yourself. If God exists outside of time, then he doesn't have the potential to remain as he is, because remaining requires time. And so maybe you'd be able to escape my objection that the purely actual actualizer would actually have to have some kind of potential, because if he exists outside of time, he doesn't really need that potential at all. But Phaser here is arguing that even timelessly existing things are actual and involve a kind of timeless actualization of potential. And so once again, he seems to open the possibility for my objection that even a timeless god must possess the potential to exist. So no, Phaser's point there was that things that are admixtures of act and potency have the potential to exist that needs to be actualized. Now, Phaser's wrong in that, but set that aside. Phaser's point was that things in which act and potency are mixed together, so things that aren't purely actual, they have a potentiality for existence that needs to be actualized. That's not going to be transferring to the case of God, right? Because God doesn't have an admixture of act and potency, right? He is purely actual under their view. And so no, the timeless God of classical theism, the purely actual God of classical theism, does not have a potential for existence because for Phaser, and as Phaser was arguing, it is precisely being an admixture of act and potency, which is what like demarcates things that have that uh, potential for existence from things that don't. Well, that's a particularly lovely face, isn't it? Would actually have to have some kind of potential, because if he exists outside of time, he doesn't really need that potential at all. But Phaser here is arguing that even timelessly existing things are actual and involve a kind of timeless actualization of potential. No, so he's not just saying because it's timeless. You know, it's like, Alex is sort of subtly under-describing what Phaser is getting at. He, Phaser is not just saying, well, even timelessly existing things have potentials for uh, existence that need to be actualized. That's not his point. Phaser's point is that even if we grant that the space-time block as a whole exists, as it were, kind of timelessly, it's still an admixture of act and potency. So it's crucially, it's being an admixture of act and potency. Not it's being timeless, but it's being an admixture of act and potency, which is what demarcates those things for by Phaser's lights that have a potential for existence. And so once again, he seems to open the possibility for my objection that even a timeless god must possess the potential to exist, and thus isn't purely actual. Yes, that was the essence of my reply to Alex's second objection. But now it seems like we're in a dilemma. If the universe can be timeless, but still require an actualizer for its potential existence, then why doesn't a timeless god require an actualizer for his potential existence? The answer is that a block universe has a distinction between its essence, or what it is, and its existence, or that it is. There are different ways for- If you appeal to that in responding to an objection to the Aristotelian proof, then you are making the Aristotelian proof parasitic on the Thomistic proof, or the Deante argument, right? You are making the Aristotelian proof no longer an independent argument in its own right. It fails as an independent argument in its own right because it crucially relies on the success of the Thomistic proof, the one which talks about the distinction between essence and existence. This is something that you always need to be aware of. Someone tries to present, quote-unquote, five proofs of the existence of God, but in order to respond to certain objections, they have to appeal to, like, other of those arguments. Like, no, uh, then you don't actually have five arguments because the success of one of them is entirely parasitic on the success of another one. And also, if you're curious, you know, I go through this uh, this sort of reasoning from essence existence composition, and I criticize it in sections 7.12 through 7.14 in this blog post here, so you think you understand existential inertia. I don't think it succeeds, so anyway. For a block universe to exist, so there must be something beyond the universe that actualizes one of those potentials 
over the others. For example, some people would say the block universe could have no beginning and no end. It's infinite. Or it could have a beginning and an end. It's finite. Or it could have a beginning and no end, or an end and no beginning. So it's just infinite in one direction. So the block universe has the potential to have zero, one, or two edges. But in order for one potential shape of the universe to exist instead of another, that potential to exist would have to be actualized by something else, which sets the stage for the argument from motion. But while in the block universe there is a difference between essence and existence, which leads to only some essences of the block universe having existence, in God there is no difference. God's essence, or what he is, just is existence. God exists in an unlimited, purely actual way. He doesn't have potential modes of existence like the block universe that have to be actualized by something else. So even if you took the most radical view of an unchanging block universe has no change whatsoever, even in our conscious minds, which seems really implausible, you would still not deny the existence of... So, I mean, keep in mind that that's not what the theoretic eternalism says, and that's what almost no proponents of it say, so just keep that in mind. I know he's just describing a, a quote-unquote radical view. I know he's not characterizing the theoretic eternalism as saying that, but I just want to mention that very few proponents of the theoretic eternalism actually take this quote-unquote radical view. ...whatsoever, even in our conscious minds, which seems really implausible, you would still not deny the existence of potentiality and actuality that ground the argument from change. Yes, you very well might deny those because firstly, you start to lose your justification for it because part of the major justification for it was accounting for change and then looking for and analyzing change. And secondly, you may very well deny it because it suffers from whole hosts of problems, like all those problems attending ontological pluralism, the view that there are multiple ways or modes of being. You might also simply not accept it because it's inadequately justified. Even if it is used in this example to show actualization apart from temporal change. Now, finally, let me address some objections to this same Ben Shapiro video from another atheist, genetically modified skeptic, who also critiqued it. At the end of the argument, he says, The infinite regress argument is just not convincing. There has to be something underlying the final term. Why is the infinite regress not convincing, though? This argument relies on our intuition to say that there isn't an infinite chain in causation, but I don't see why we should rely on intuition to determine that an infinite regress is or is not possible. I'm not saying there is an infinite regress, but for this argument to work, it needs to demonstrate that an infinite regress isn't possible, not just rely on us to feel like it's not. So at this point, I do want to plug this excellent article criticizing these sorts of, uh, like the arguments that Phaser and Kerr and Caleb Coho and so on give for thinking that per se chains or chains of ontological dependence must be finite. It's an article by Thomas Oberlay, Grounding Infinite Regress in the Thomistic Cosmological Argument. I will link this in the description. Yeah, it's pretty good, and it goes through the arguments that people like. It goes through Gavin Kerr. It has one on uh, Ed Fazer's case, Caleb Coho's case, uh, John Haldane's case, and, and it basically argues that they fail to make the case that it's impossible for there to be these infinitely descending chains of ontological dependence. So anyway, just check that out if you're interested. I talk about this paper in my 10K AMA briefly. You can check out the timestamps in the pinned comment for some of my comments on the article. That's a good question. And Phaser defends that at length in his book, Five Proofs. The reason is that the- And Oberlay criticizes it at length in his paper there. Causal chain is essential, not accidental in nature. Think about a chain of dominoes. You could destroy all the previous dominoes that fell, and this would not stop future dominoes from falling. It's an accidentally ordered series. But an essentially ordered series is like a bunch of gears. If you take out any gear in the series, the entire series stops spinning. If the series were infinitely long, but every gear can only be turned by a previous gear, then none of them will turn, which is similar to the train example I gave earlier. The impossibility of an infinitely long, essentially ordered series is explained by Garrigou Lagrange, who said, to do away with a supreme cause is to claim that, as someone has said, a brush will paint by itself provided it has a very long handle. So in these sorts of cases, they're imagining something which already lacks the relevant causal power, and then they're saying, oh, well, you know, if, if there's nothing which imparts it the relevant causal power, of course, it's not going to have the relevant causal power. But in the cases that they're presenting, like the case of the paintbrush, right, it already is in kind of like a state of lacking the causal power of, you know, painting something. It's a separate question whether or not you, you know, you come to something which is already having the causal power and then inquiring as to whether or not there must be a first cause of that particular chain or whatever. This is a point that Oberlay makes, and he makes it more eloquently and so on and more rigorously. The Garigou Lagrange example, or Garigou Lagrange or whatever, <laughs> it's kind of stacking the deck in favor of their view. They're, they're taking obvious individual instances wherein something 
is already in a state of not having the relevant causal power. And then they're saying, oh, yeah, in order for it to have the causal power, it needs to have a first member that, you know, imparts it to it. Well, yeah, obviously, of course. But that doesn't entail that absolutely every single chain of ontological dependence must be finite. That's something that's more generally quite frustrating about, you know, appeals to like individual examples, which are supposed to be like proving this wide ranging philosophical thesis about like the finitude of all per se chains or all chains of ontological dependence. It's like, even if you can show that like an individual case intuitively needs a first cause or uh, intuitively is impossible, that doesn't show that absolutely every cases of the relevant kind are impossible. Even if I grant the entire argument, why call the purely actual actualizer God? This argument doesn't point to an anthropomorphic being in any way. Why assume that this actualizer is conscious or intelligent? In five proofs, most of Phaser's argument from motion is dedicated to showing that a purely actual actualizer must have divine attributes. Since it can't undergo change, the actualizer must be timeless and immaterial. It doesn't follow that it's immaterial. You can have a perfectly material physical thing which is intrinsically unchangeable. ...be necessary because it has no potential for non-existence, given that it is existence itself. You don't establish that it is existence itself just by establishing that it is a purely actual actualizer. That comes in the Thomistic proof later on. In the Aristotelian proof, you're just showing that it doesn't have any potentials for change or cross-world variance. It's a separate question how its existence relates to its essence and whether or not those are even metaphysical components of reality to begin with. What Trent just said is not shown by the Aristotelian proof. Phaser produces proofs for many other attributes, including... <laughs> proofs, with like 30 billion air quotes around that. Including a technical argument for the purely actual actualizer being all-knowing because it is the cause of all relations in the universe. Now, I'm not gonna- <laughs> There can be things that don't have any knowledge that are causes of all the relations in the universe. I'm not gonna go too deep into that argument, but I'll just say that you have a strange form of atheism if you believe the ultimate foundation of reality sustains all existence, but is not made of matter and isn't located in time or space. I don't think that's strange at all. I've gone over atemporal wave function monism. There are perfectly respectable views in uh, philosophy of physics, philosophy of science, and metaphysics. Let's see, for instance, the work of Alyssa Ney, Jill North, Julian Barber, Sean Carroll, etc., where space-time is non-fundamental, and it is either grounded in or functionally realized by a more fundamental non-spatiotemporal universal wave function. This is a perfectly kosher metaphysical view of reality, and yet that non-spatiotemporal universal wave function is first physical, uh, secondly, it is the ultimate ground of every spatiotemporal thing, and thirdly, it's timeless, and so it doesn't have any potentials for change or anything like that, right? So no, that's not a strange form of atheism. It's actually a naturalistic vision of reality that's been defended by several able philosophers as of late existence but is not made of matter and isn't located in time it's, it's physical right so in that sense it's material if we understand physical and material to be interchangeable now of course you could define material differently but or space lastly why assume it's a single thing rather than multiple why can't there be multiple purely actual things if there has to be at least one if the consciousness or intelligence of this thing is being assumed couldn't this argument be used to support forms of theism other than monotheism if there were two purely actual actualizers, then neither could be purely actual. Each of them would have to exist in a common framework more basic than either of them. Why? Why? I mean, you can just assert that. But you're trying to justify why there could only be one in principle. Firstly, what even is a framework? I don't even understand what a framework is. Secondly, why would they have to exist in a common framework? Thirdly, why would they have to exist in a common framework that is more fundamental than them? Why? Again, you can just assert all these things, but why? And, and by the way, I've actually already responded to this quote-unquote framework argument in one of my other responses to Trent Horn that I've already made. Uh, I don't know if Trent has seen though. I mean, I sent them to him and, you know, he said, he said thank you and, you know, things like that. Uh, but, you know, maybe he hasn't seen them or maybe he has responses that he just hasn't published yet or whatever. For, for a more in-depth investigation into this, this quote-unquote common framework argument, uh, check out my other responses to, to Trent Horn because I offer various different objections to it in there. In short, it's just uh, thoroughly un unjustified. And it would be this framework that ultimately explained reality, not the actualizers. Also, if there were two of them... So, okay, so I see he gives literally no justification for it. Nice. If they're two separate beings, each of them would have a potential whose actuality lies in the other. Why? Why? Why can't they both be purely actual? You're literally supposed to be performing a reductio on the assumption that they're both purely actual. But then why would each of them have to have a potentiality? Things. Each of them would have a potential whose actuality lies in the other. So neither- a Potential whose actuality lies in the other. So I don't really know what having a potentiality whose actuality lies in another even means. But also, I mean, Trent just flatly asserts this. 
there could be purely actual in that respect. So I hope you enjoy. Why? So you, you can start to see why these stage two inferences are so amazingly bad. Stage one it has this all this complicated metaphysical theorizing, and you know, they, they develop like really extensive, they, or they try to develop a really extensive justifications for their premises. And then it comes to stage two when you're getting to God, and then you, you just get these like bare assertions that come from nowhere and that are hardly intelligible. I just like to note the discrepancy in so many of these arguments between stage one and stage two this journey into some higher level of philosophy of religion. And I'm really grateful to see people like Alex O'Connor diving into this and reading books like Phaser's Five Proofs in order to examine what I think are some of the best arguments for the existence of God. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, if you want to know what I think are some of the best arguments for the existence of God, read like Proust and Rasmussen's Necessary Existence, look at different Bayesian arguments from consciousness and so on. Maybe don't look at the uh, the five proofs. But anyway, uh, you can see my, my forthcoming book, Existential Nourish and Classical Theistic Proofs, for uh, an extensive justification for that, uh, a justification that's like 350 pages long. Thank you, Trent, for making this particular video. Thank you, Alex, for making your original video. I was uh, quite critical of the ideas that both of you had put forth, but, you know, that's okay. Uh, it's all in the service of truth, all in the service of, well, serving one another, serving each of us in our pursuit of truth and in our collective inquiry. So anyway, what, what, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason, and peace out.